Hello everyone, my name is Ashutosh Mishra and I am the CEO of the Institute for Australia-India Engagement here in Brisbane and the Editor-in-Chief of India News Australia. As a scholar, there are a variety of ways in which a scholar feels proud. For instance, when a scholarly work or his book gets published in an A-star journal or the book gets published by a renowned international university press or when a work gets cited in a noted scholarly work or in government reports. But today, my pride surpasses all these potential achievements because today I have been invited by Professor Kanti Bajpai who is the Wilmer Chair at the National University of Singapore. And I am going to interview him on his scholarly work which has just been launched, India versus China, why India and China cannot be friends. This work is making waves around the world. And why this is a very proud moment for me? Because in the mid-1990s, Professor Bajpai supervised me for my doctoral research. I was his first PhD at the Jawaharlal Nehru University in New Delhi. And in that thesis, I worked on another enduring rivalry that is India and Pakistan. When that book was launched in 2010 in New Delhi, Professor Kanti Bajpayee was there with me and the book was launched by then Vice President of India, Honorable Hamid Ansari. So as I said, this is a very proud moment for me because Professor Kanti Bajpayee, who supervised me in my PhD and I, being his first PhD student, was very honored in 2010 to dedicate my work to him as his Guru Dakshina. So today, interviewing him and being kindly invited by him to interview him on his work is a very proud moment for me because I believe there's nothing more gratifying and proud for a scholar than being, than being invited by his own guru to talk to him and interview him on his own work. Hope you enjoy the interview. Thank you. Professor Kanti Prasad Vajpayee, good afternoon from Australia. And, and thank you for uh, coming uh, to speak to uh, the uh, India News and also Institute for Australia and India Engagement, where I'm based as the CEO of the Institute. And let me begin by congratulating you on your uh, new book. And I've heard it's making waves around the world. And you've been widely interviewed. And I'm sure it makes a very valuable and significant contribution to the existing literature on the subject. And, uh, and I really enjoyed uh, reading, reading that book. And for me, it's, it's an absolute honor and delight to be invited by my guru uh, to interview him on his work. And, uh, and as you, uh, you, you know that you were my supervisor in Jawaharlal Nehru University, I was your first PhD. So I can understand where that rigor comes from in your book and you were extra rigorous and strict uh, on my PhD. So congratulations on the book, uh, Professor Vajpayee. And uh, uh, let me begin by asking you, what are the key takeaways uh, from the book? Well, as you know, thanks very much, first of all, Ashutosh. It's so good to see you uh, here uh, in this role. And uh, we haven't met face to face for a long time. But uh, and uh, as far as the uh, former professor, former student relationship goes, they say those close to you are your biggest critics. And so I hope you'll push me hard. Um, having said that, uh, on the book, uh, first of all, let me say, you know, it's aimed towards a general readership. So, uh, and I'm not a China specialist per se, so I don't do Chinese domestic politics and so on. My attempt here really was, as you say, in a sense, to provide some takeaways, uh, stimulating further debate. So I, I see this as a kind of an opening statement, I hope a provocative one, I hope, as you said kindly, a rigorous one, but certainly not the last word. 
And what the book does is it, it's a synthesis. It brings together data and perspectives that are out there. And I thought there's a lot of interesting work there. Uh, why not pull it together, write a quick book, this was written in three months, and see how people react and, and whether it adds to the debate. I mean, I think that's an open question. But four takeaways, essentially, the four Ps, uh, perceptions between the two countries, the quarrel over territorial perimeters, the second P, and that includes Tibet, which is intrinsic to the border issue. The third P is partnerships. That is, how do their dispositions vis-a-vis -vis particularly the Soviet Union, the United States during the Cold War, and thereafter Russia and the United States in the post-Cold War period, how has that affected uh, their mutual relations as well? And the last P is power, uh, comprehensive national power. Where do they stack up vis-a-vis uh, -vis each other? And I think four takeaways from those chapters, if I had to just boil them down and squeeze them into some propositions. In the first case, mutual perceptions, I think up to a point historically, let's say until about you know, the year 1000 at least uh, and beyond maybe up to the time that uh, you know, uh, China peaked uh, under the, the Mings and so on, um, around the 15th century, uh, they had mutual respect. And from then on with the intervention of colonialism and by the late 19th century, particularly I think on the Chinese elite level, they began to be a different view of India, not so respectful. And I think in the 20th century, both sides have looked at each other where a fair amount of disdain and suspicion. The second P, I mean, I think this is a very well known one, but I mean, in essence, in two cycles, first in, during the Cold War, they went from really an attempt to cooperate over the border problem and Tibet, and were fairly successful up to a point into increasing conflict and disjuncture. And this cycle, you know, uh, repeats itself after the Cold War. So again, after the Cold War, there are border negotiations of increasing intensity, confidence building measures, trade and all of that. And yet on the border itself, uh, things begin to go into decline. And in a sense, you peak at conflict again, not in war this time altogether as in 1962, but in Ladakh last year, 2020. The third takeaway is that, and this is a simple one, I think, is that India and China have never been on the same side strategically. That is to say, sometimes the Chinese have been allied with the Soviet Union when the Indians were not quite aligned with anyone. Sometimes India has been aligned with the United States during the 1962 war against China, and again, haven't been on the same side. Uh, later in the Cold War, China was with the United States and India was with the Soviet Union. Again, they weren't on the same side. Uh, and likewise, after the Cold War, uh, India has gravitated increasingly to the United States, still has something of a relationship with the Russians, but China is very, uh, is increasingly alienated from the Americans and closer to the Russians. So again, they haven't been on the same side. And I think, you know, except for two very brief periods of Entente when they were together in the Cold War and after the Cold War against the Americans, uh, because America was dominant, Except for those very brief periods, they've never really been on the same side. And that, that means that they don't have a long-term basis for, for trust. And finally, in comprehensive national power terms, and I think this probably most of your viewers have an instinct for if they haven't tracked it, is that until about 1980, roughly, you could say India and China, in terms of comprehensive national power, and we can talk about what that is later, were about equal. India was somewhat behind, but not very appreciably so perhaps, especially economically. But today, as we know, the gap is enormous, particularly economically. China is five times India's size in GDP terms. And so what that means is that China is so powerful, my sense is that it doesn't see the need to make concessions to India. And on the Indian side, because it's so much weaker today, it feels it difficult to make any reasonable concessions either for fear of being accused by its own people of appeasing China, of surrendering. So here are four reasons that, you know, that drive the kind of alienation, why they are not friends. You have, uh, you have mentioned four Ps, and then in one of your interviews previously, you mentioned the fifth P that was Pakistan, and then, and I add a sixth P, which is the pandemic. And uh, so, so these are all, uh, you know, very well uh, said elements, uh, Professor Bajpayee, which uh, in a way suggest why we are not friends. So on that point, 
let me begin by uh, picking bones with you. When um, when you supervised me in the Jawaharlal Nehru University, I looked at another uh, enduring rivalry under your supervision that was India and Pakistan. And at that time, we decided that we look at the cooperative side of the relationship, the positive side of relationship, and we, if we were able to show that India-Pakistan can cooperate, a different picture of bilateral relations emerges, which is not as conflictual as generally perceived to be. And with your supervision, I managed to do that to a very large extent. But in this thesis, you have not taken that positive or cooperative side, but you have gone to the negative side of things, why we cannot be friends, rather than why we can be friends. So why this change in approach and looking at this enduring rivalry? Yeah, I think that's a good point. I mean, I, I remember your thesis very well, and uh, I think it's still a very valuable contribution to the literature. Uh, one could uh, uh, posit the India-China relationship that way, and Professor T.V. Paul of McGill University produced a volume that used that enduring rivalry or protracted rivalry framework. The reason I didn't is, I mean, it's partly marketing, to be very honest. I mean, uh, juggernaut of uh, books came to me. They said, look, Ladakh has happened. There's space for a, a provocative book. Uh, not an irresponsible book, but a provocative book at a time when the two are uh, clearly in, in quite a bit of uh, hot water with each other in difficulty. And uh, so can you write a book on why they're not friends? Because the last 20, 30 years, you know, an, uh, an impression was created on both sides by their leaderships, their foreign policy establishments, that things were gradually improving, that they were being managed well, that, uh, you know, the future looked good. Perhaps a border uh, solution wasn't quite around the corner, but uh, at any rate, uh, there was no expectation that things would get very hot on the border either. Yet, you know, um, uh, marketing aside, if you look at what's been happening since about 2006, you can see that there's been a kind of deterioration in the relationship, which I per personally didn't quite pick up either. And I edited another book and had some other writings which didn't pick it up either. It did strike me in looking back on it, that from about 06 onwards, uh, you see the Chinese, for instance, stating very clearly that they now uh, hold a very serious claim to all of Arunachal Pradesh. I mean, they always laid claim to it, but they repeated it in public at a time when it seemed the relationship was good. By about 2010, India is pulling back on its kind of uh, you know, recognition of Chinese uh, uh, integration of Tibet. After 2010, if my memory serves me correctly, and they have not in any of the joint statements uh, repeated the formula that you know, Tibet is part of China and so on. So that's another indication that things were going bad. And from 2014, sorry, 2013 onwards, we have a series of border episodes which are more than mere transgressions, so-called, just you know, minor incursions which are defused. 2013 in uh, the Depsang area, 2014 at Shumar, even as Modi and Xi Jinping were sitting on a jula, a swing uh, in, during their summit in Gujarat. 2015, we've forgotten there was another uh, uh, episode in Bertsi, again in Eastern Ladakh. Uh, the media in India particularly has seemed to have forgotten that episode. Uh, so that's three of them just there in Eastern Ladakh in the sector that last year was at issue. 2017, everyone will remember Doklam, of course, 73 days of a confrontation, and then of course, 2020. So there is reason to think that things have gone wrong and for asking ourselves whether there's something more enduring now that's on the negative side. I take your point completely, and the book does say right at the start that there have been elements of cooperation, and I pointed it out in respect of territorial issues and CBMs and so on, but it just seems like there are some drivers there that seem more kind of important and fundamental that are pushing the relationship towards conflict. And that's what the book gets at. It can't do everything. I think there's space, of course, to write the cooperative side of the story. Yeah, maybe your next project could be with me when we look at the cooperative side of things uh, in the yeah, near future. Yeah, you're right. I mean, your book was interesting, particularly because where there the question was, despite this kind of these drivers of enduring conflict, how come they still manage to chalk out areas of cooperation? So it kind of flips the question on its head. This book does the opposite. It says, despite cooperation, how come we're getting conflict? Your question, interestingly, was despite uh, driving conflict between India and Pakistan in that case, how come there are elements of cooperation? I think there's space for both. 
it's a matter of timing and a matter of what you do in a particular book at a particular time. Yeah. Thank you so much for that, uh, uh, Professor Vajpayee. But uh, today is the day when we talk about your book, not my book. Um, the uh, Let me come on to the first P and you talked about perceptions. And in that I've read in your book, you mentioned uh, soft power. Then you also talk about hard power. And, uh, and then you wrote that China betters India when it comes to soft power. And so my, my question is that I'm a bit intrigued uh, because uh, I have a feeling that uh, here perhaps we are conflating a propaganda with soft power. Uh, if we look at what has happened over the last uh, one and a half year, and uh, you talked about Loi uh, Sawe, and I recall there was this October 2020 Pew Research uh, survey, which was done in 14 countries, which showed that 61% people are not looking at in, uh, China very favorably. And in Australia, 81% were looking at uh, China very unfavorably. And the Loi uh, survey itself showed that 93% of Australians thought now that uh, China was having a very negative influence because of its military activities. And, uh, and only 16% thought that China will act uh, responsibly internationally. And the same survey says now that more than 60% Australian trusted India for what India has been doing in, in recent years. And, and I relate to the global leader approval rating tracker where we show Modi is ahead of the rest of the leaders around the world because of what India did during the pandemic, reaching out to 150 nations. And, and when you relate to that with the soft power concept, uh, you, you recall that uh, 2009 RAND report, they talked about influence operations and which they, uh, which has been referred to by scholars as the sharp power. And, and as a result, we have seen how China has been using its scholars, institutions uh, to shape public opinion, but that is all backfiring now. Uh, people, uh, Confucian Institute are being shut down, fundings are being declined. Uh, so around the world, we see that now people are seeing that propaganda behind all these moves. So, so is it important to differentiate between soft power and propaganda? Yeah, I mean, first of all, just to uh, uh, correct you slightly, I mean, the first chapters and perceptions, mutual perceptions, it's not on the soft power. That comes in the fourth chapter, which is on power. But uh, yeah, I can see how those two could get uh, mixed up. Um, yeah, I think that, you know, the, the soft power issue is one that's raised the most questions because I think a lot of people assume that India with its relatively open political system, uh, democracy, you know, a, 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 a lively press and so on, uh, at least until recently. I think now there are some questions about how robust all those institutions are in India. Um, but still, on the whole, compared to China at least, one could say that uh, pretty fairly that uh, India is a more open and democratic and, and lively, uh, there's a lively debate there. Um, so it, it, it's counterintuitive that, uh, you know, a lot of measures seem to show that, in fact, uh, the soft power measures go uh, in China's favor. Um, my own sense is that, you know, one has to be a bit careful uh, about two things. One is clearly there are negative views of China out there, uh, right? Um, but the question here is uh, how many views are there or how profound are the views that are approving of India relative to China? Uh, and what are the kind of soft power resources that the two have? Uh, and where does the balance lie? It may very well be that on certain measures, such as China's conduct in foreign policy around the world, influence operations is quite negative, but they're also very positive views of China as an economic powerhouse, uh, as a grand uh, civilization, uh, as a country that is, um, in a, is very modernized. Um, a country that has a system of governance, which you know um, we may or may not approve of, but given that most of the world uh, has leaderships and political systems that are authoritarian, not democratic, uh, I would suggest that many countries around the world, if not perhaps a majority, uh, are fairly comfortable with China's system of governance. Um, they're not uncomfortable with it. Yes, Australia is uncomfortable with it. India is un uncomfortable with it. New Zealand maybe, and the Western democracies maybe. But we're a small minority of the world. Uh, uh, if you look at Asia, most of the countries are not democratic, and they see China as competent. Their leadership as technocratically savvy, uh, as stabilizing. Uh, they see the proof of the pudding, which is enormous gains in economic uh, sort of uh, um, uh, prosperity. 
Um, they see a kind of a master plan and a China that sticks to a line of policy and so on. Doesn't seem to chop and change like democracies with every electoral cycle. So I think one shouldn't, one has to be careful here. Uh, the Australian view, the Indian view, the Japanese, New Zealand, American view is not the totality of the world views of China by any means. And on the other side, you know, um, I think we're in this region, uh, you know, it's not always an open and shut case for India in terms of soft power. If, we, if, if countries look at India's internal governance uh, and so on, a lot of them conclude that it's chaotic. Uh, it doesn't seem to achieve what it sets out to achieve. Uh, that there's a constant spate of elections and, and you know, and, and, and instability. So, you know, um, uh, India may not worry them uh, in terms of its foreign policy moves and so on. It's a much weaker power. Uh, but is there great admiration for India's internal workings? I'm not so sure. I think it's quite split. So I think this is where we have to be careful is that people don't fear India, but they don't necessarily uh, look to it with great admiration for its economic, political and social system. Uh, they may fear China relative to India, but there are many things they admire in China's uh, governance and its, its competence in doing what it sets out to do. Uh, so as I say, you know, these are opening statements. And I think to the extent that they're provoking questions like yours, quite rightly, and uh, you know, I've had questions like this in other forums, I think that's a, that's a good beginning. I think we in India have to think very seriously about not automatically taking uh, soft power in our favor with China. Uh, no, yeah, I mean, your point is well made that uh, the liberal democracies they are sort of the kind of pushback which is coming from them. It's not sizable, but that's where the hope lies in terms of ensuring an order in the future, which is more transparent and rule based and uh, and uh, uh, which which uh, respects the sovereignty and territoriality in the region, especially in the Pacific. Uh, uh, and why I related uh, soft power with the perception, because in the power section, I was having a different question. I thought I'll bring soft power in this section. So that's why I put it here. Coming on to the second uh, P, uh, Professor Baj, by uh, talking about perimeter, perimeters, territorial perimeters, and why uh, there has been one of the reasons why we have not been friends. And on page 72, you, uh, you have mentioned two very interesting schools, sooner school and the later school. And, um, and the Sunda school represented it by uh, your own uncle, Girja Shankar Bajpai. My grandfather. Your grandfather, Girja Shankar Bajpai, Asada Vallabhai Patel and Krishna Menon. And the later school represented- KPS Menon. KPS Menon, Chris, KPS Menon. And, and the later, later school represented by Pandit Nehru and Kem Panikar. And uh, you said uh, that the Sunda school uh, linked the final Tibet agreement to a border settlement. Whereas the later school represented by Pandit Nehru and Ms. Panika said that we have to wait until China raised the border issue. And, and you wrote that the Sunar school, uh, which is the, uh, led by uh, Girja Shankar Bajpayee and Sadhav Patel, the Sunar school thought it was better to know what India was up against early in the relationship. Whereas the later school wanted to give China and India time to settle into a relationship, to use diplomacy to build goodwill, and to increase Indian political and military capacities. And you go on to mention that in 1954, Nehru signed an agreement with China and with that, Delhi gave up its right in Tibet. And later you say that India had a case, why it did so. My question is at the cost of Tibet? Well, yeah, this, uh, it's important to say that uh, there was the sooner school and later school, by the way, these are my terms, not the terms they would have used. <clears throat> but um, the Chinese had exactly the same schools, uh, which I point out in the book. So there was a group in, in China, particularly the cartographers and the historians of India-China-Tibet relations who argued for the sooner position, deal with India now and try and solve the problem and assert China's uh, sovereignty over Tibet and over certain border areas like Nifa, which is today Arunachal. And then there was a later school, which was probably Mao and Zhou and Lai in particular, and, and some others in the party who said, no, China's not ready. China had just come out of a civil war, a world war, uh, the Korean war, and, and so on. So it was consolidating itself. Um, and India had similar kinds of, of dynamics going on. So, you know, they, in a sense, an opportunity was lost between 1949 and about 1954. If the sooner schools had prevailed, they might have got to the 
to the negotiating table sooner and perhaps things would have been different, uh, who knows. But on the issue of Tibet, I mean, I think uh, one has to be careful here. Um, and I think on the whole, Nehru uh, was right. Uh, you know, he more he kind of fluctuated. Sometimes he was a bit closer to the Bajpai Patel school, Sunna school. Sometimes he went towards uh, uh, Panikkar. In the end, he went towards Panikkar on, on this issue. But, and you bring uh, that out in the book. Uh, yeah, uh, and very I think cleverly. it's a yes. question. <clears throat> and his basic problem was India didn't have the military and perhaps even the economic and diplomatic and political power to do much in Tibet if the Chinese seriously were to invade Tibet and take control. So it was a losing game. And, um, you know, why get into a situation where one of your earliest foreign policy moves, and by the way, don't forget at this time, uh, we had already fought a war with Pakistan over Kashmir. Um, and we were dealing with the Anglo-American powers who were not sympathetic to our pos position on Kashmir either. So at that time then to also take on the Chinese in Tibet and perhaps lose and lose quite badly uh, would have been a further difficulty for India and for Nehru domestically. So I think that it's all very well to say that, you know, we kind of lost Tibet, but um, it was a very, uh, it would have been a very difficult call to try and take a strong, let's say, military position on Tibet. Diplomatically, Nehru did try to, you know, uh, give a certain amount of support to Tibet. We even gave some early military support to Tibet in 1940, uh, 40, 49. Uh, but uh, uh, and remember also that amongst the Anglo-American powers, if we talk diplomacy, uh, London had never declared itself for an independent Tibet. And uh, London at that time was still a major power in the international system. The Americans were important, but they were looking elsewhere. So, you know, looking to London's position also, it wasn't clear that we would get even diplomatic support on Tibet beyond the point. Um, so I think, you know, it was a, worth a risk to uh, get an agreement on Tibet and then hope that that would generate enough goodwill uh, such that when the border issue finally came up, that India would uh, be able to use that uh, capital, as it were, with China to get a deal. In the event that didn't happen, and I try to explain why that didn't happen either. Yes, and I think uh, uh, with regards to London's role and the lack of support from London, uh, I had also seen when I was analyzing the India-Pakistan conflict in the 1960s and, and why we had gone for the ceasefire and everything and because of the lack of international support, including not coming from London. So uh, yes, yes, the point is well taken, uh, Professor Bajpai. Coming on to the third uh, P, that is the partnerships. And uh, you talk about, uh, you mentioned in the beginning of the interview how we have never been on the same side of strategic partnerships uh, of India and China. And I, and I think this, this chapter is, is a very well-written chapter and for scholars of history and political science, national relations, the way you have captured the back and forth uh, of you know, going off India and China with regards to their strategic partnership, talking about Atat and Datat. And so I think you have very wonderfully captured the trapeze that India and China have been doing with regards to their relationship with the United States and USSR and uh, Russia. Uh, during that period, uh, and 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 not many perhaps are aware that uh, how supportive United States has been of India during that conflict, and you have mentioned that uh, in fact uh, United States were very close to actually becoming a military partner and actually putting goods on the ground, uh, but for you know uh, hostility hostility stopping from the Chinese side. Not many are aware this this kind of support that had come from the United States. Uh, but in that chapter on page 81, Professor Bajpai, then you write, to some extent then, India and China have come to look at each other warily for reasons beyond their bilateral quarrels. Now, this statement, uh, I mean, to me, it leaves so much ground to cover for India and also to China, so much so that any chance of sustainable peace uh, seems highly, highly remote. And that's why having said that there's so much ground to cover and then narrowing it down that in order to match up to China, in order to have peace, uh, narrowing it down to the need for civilized national change on part of India. Do you think it's, it's, it's a bit narrow uh, a recommendation sort of to cover such a vast ground? Yeah, so there's a lot in that question, but I, I would just say on the partnerships issue, uh, the problem uh, I think has always been there that, um, you know, uh, China has certainly 
chosen partners aligned with uh, bigger powers, uh, but has done so against uh, the two big powers. So China was with the Soviets against the Americans. It was with the Americans against the Soviets, but it didn't need either the Americans or the Soviets against India. Whereas India has always had to partner either the Americans or the Soviets or the Russians, uh, actually we, never really the Russians in the post-Cold War period uh, against China. So, you know, that relationship is a bit odd. We always need the balancer against China. China needs a balance against its other great power rivals, not against India, because it thinks it can handle India by itself. So I think it's a little complicated there between in the quadrilateral uh, for India and China. They're doing different things there. Um, and the reason I said that there are things beyond their mutual rivalry that affect them is that, you know, this workings of the quadrilateral play back into their relationship. I mean, when um, um, the Americans made the opening to China in 1971 and became their alliance partner, um, and then uh, Pakistan was in the mix, India found itself pretty isolated. Uh, but the American opening to China had nothing to do with India. It had to do with dealing with the Soviet Union, but it impacted India very badly. Uh, likewise, today, I mean, I would say that, you know, uh, clearly the Americans are uh, pallying up to India uh, to deal with China because of their strategic rivalry. I don't think the Americans per se are terribly interested in the India-China quarrel. Uh, indeed, the Americans have never supported us on the border issue in Arunachal Pradesh. Uh, they've given uh, some support. Uh, some support, uh, I'm sorry, it's the other way around. They've uh, 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 accepted that the McMahon line is, is, is correct, but in uh, Ladakh, they've always been rather iffy about the border. So, you know, uh, again, the Chinese-American rivalry is impacting India because the Chinese uh, think that we're, we're getting close to the Americans and uh, that might uh, help tip the balance against them in Asia. Um, so it has very little to do with the India-China quarrel per se. It has to do with India getting close to the Americans, part of a larger strategic rivalry. Okay, that said, I mean, your larger question then about then how does India make up this power differential? Well, one way is of course to borrow power, which is uh, partnerships or alliances with another great power, which India has always done and continues to do. But, you know, at the end of the day, no power, especially one of India's size is going to depend on an external balancer. So it has to build up its own power. And there I end the book by sort of saying, you know, it's not just a matter of trying to up our economic growth rates to catch up with the Chinese. It's not just a matter of trying to take a huge leap forward technologically or build, uh, narrowing the military gap with China and so on, um, or even making sure the Americans are on our side. I mean, fundamentally, if you want to be a great power to match another great power, you have to have an imagination of power, I think, and what it is to be a power. And I think India has never quite had that uh, in the way that the Chinese have so conclusively. And one reason for that is that I think, I put it out as a hypothesis, is that China went through total war. All the great powers today went through a period of total warfare. India and all the countries of South Asia is, are the only parts of Asia that have never seen total warfare. It came right up to Burma with the Japanese invasion, but India, United India at that point has not known total warfare. And to, what total warfare does is it fuses a society in the state uh, in, in terms of then your external ability to be secure and to have ambitions uh, outside. And in India, that has not happened, I think. You know? I mean, I'm not wishing total warfare in India, of course not, but it induces a kind of civilizational change. And I think India hasn't had that. And I portray civilizational change you know, not going back to some golden age of, you know, the past was wonderful um, and we need to, to replicate that. But looking forward, you know, what kind of a civilizational change do we need? And I say egalitarianism and the emancipation of millions of people uh, who are still in a feudal lifestyle, essentially. I mean, India is still about 65% living in its villages. Villages are not great democratic spaces, <laughs> uh, frankly, and progressive spaces. Uh, you cannot build a great power on a rural society. They've all been built gradually on urban societies. And China today is over 50% urban. India is still at 65. Most of Asia is past 50% urban. It's the urbanness means emancipation of people, the mobility of people, uh, a different lifestyle, uh, uh, you know, moving away from traditional uh, bonds and, and boundaries, being more experimental in their lives, being more creative, 
And I think unless India has that, that sense of egalitarianism and emancipation and experimentalism in social life, it'll be very difficult to catch up with China. Let me uh, quickly ask a linked question to it, uh, Professor Vajpayee, uh, on the civilizational change issue. Uh, and in one of the interviews also, you uh, talked about uh, the difference between Hindutva and Hinduism, why it is important to differentiate between the two and why you're not very comfortable with recreating and rewriting the past or the history by invoking some of the figures uh, to stoke na national pride, you know. Uh, and But when I look at China, China has been doing the same, uh, whether it's uh, invoking Confucius and also uh, Zheng He, the maritime explorer who went around the world on voyages and forcing countries to pay tributes to China. China used uh, Zheng He and portrayed him uh, during the 2008 Olympics. So they are also uh, invoking these historical figures to sort of, in a way, bring about some sort of civilizational change under uh, Xi Jinping. So is there a kind of a dichotomy uh, when you say uh, that India shouldn't be doing that while China is doing the same thing? No, I mean, I, I don't mean to say that, you know, as a country, a society will not draw on its past, uh, but it's one thing to, uh, you know, cold eyed draw on uh, the past in a certain way. And it's another thing to romanticize the past and pretend that everything was fine in the past. If everything was fine in the past, why does India find itself in the position it's in today, right? Uh, why did it uh, fall to uh, a, a colonial powers? Why did it fall repeatedly to invasions uh, from different parts of the world? If everything was so hunky-dory in the past, then that should never have happened or should not have happened as frequently as it did. Um, and I think, you know, so a critical use of the past is, 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 is of course, inevitable. I mean, no society can, uh, you know, uh, live a life which is uh, de novo without any reference to its roots. Uh, so that's not my point. I think the, my point is really that don't romanticize the past and don't paint it as if, you know, uh, there's nothing to fix. And that if we just went back to some idyllic past, you can't go back to some idyllic past when all the vectors, however slowly, are pointing in the other direction, which is of a massive urban modernized society. I, I think it's urbanizing too slowly and modernizing too slowly, but the fact is that that's, you know, the way the world goes. And uh, to think that we can go back uncritically to the past just doesn't work. And as far as Hindutva goes, I mean, I mean those elements of Hindutva, which draw subtly and sensibly on the great strengths of Hinduism as a religion and of, uh, uh, of Indian society, I think are, are perfectly okay. But if Hindutva means, you know, in the hands of some, uh, the lynchings, uh, you know, the, the kind of interventions in, pe in who sh can marry who uh, in uh, stirring up uh, hatred uh, against other, uh, against minorities uh, and putting them in their place. I mean, equally, uh, I don't endorse uh, other faiths that look backwards uh, to some golden period and stir up the same kinds of animosities. Mm -hmm. I think all mm -hmm. communities in India have to get past that. But obviously, uh, for Hinduism, uh, for Hindus, there's a special responsibility because we're by far the biggest community. Uh, and the way we go is the way the country will go eventually, uh, it seems to me. Uh, and, and so that's my point, I think. And I think it's a very, uh, as you know, that's a very uh, sensitive and debatable issue in India. And, and I think uh, what you have put is very succinctly and very uh, nicely uh, that uh, when, when we are uh, re resorting to uh, the Hindutva way of building, uh, building India, it is important to remember that we take the good things, you know, by going back into the past. And I think this is something I, uh, I see that Prime Minister Modi is, is, is sometimes not very comfortable with the way many people are using the term Hindutva. Yeah, I mean, take the issue of science, which is so intrinsic to building a, a modern experimental mm -hmm. society. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, we have a grand Indian tradition mm -hmm. uh, from our Hindu past and, and the past of other faiths in India, uh, which is fantastic. But there's also, you know, views expressed sometimes by Hindutva proponents about all kinds of zany ideas about science. Uh, you know, uh, including during this pandemic, uh, that you could take this herb or that herb or, you know, uh, just do some yoga and you'll be fine. I mean, that's just laughable. Yes, yeah, I, I, I completely mean, agree with you. I completely agree with you. And I think, yeah. That's a good name. <laughs> yeah. And I think how you have balanced the two, I think, uh, would be music to many of the people uh, in the current government. And, uh, and so would be what uh, my next question is. And when I'm talking about power, the fourth P, uh, Professor Bajpayee, in your book. Um, and in your book, uh, you have referred to uh, 
India's new self-reliance program of Aath Nirbhar Abhiyan. And, uh, and it seems that the Modi government preempted your prescription of bolstering India's domestic industrial capabilities and production. And in your, uh, in, in power, uh, the section, uh, Professor Bajpayee, you, uh, you talked about the comprehensive national power concept uh, and you were comparing the two. And, uh, and then you were making projections that how China uh, would be, where China would be placed by 2030 or 2035 or uh, 2050. And uh, so, but my, my, my point is that um, now it seems that what has transpired uh, internationally in the last one and a half years, it seems that 12 months now is, is too long a time in international politics now. Uh, forget going to 2030 or 2050. Uh, and I, I am saying this because I refer to a piece by Bill Connolly in the Forbes magazine he wrote uh, in May, 2021. And he wrote that uh, China's economic miracle is ending. And he says that Xi Jinping lighter, tighter control of the economy will diminish future growth. And he says, uh, uh, China's governance has moved into an anti-growth direction. And he was referring to Jack Ma's uh, episode. And similarly, uh, one article by Charlie Campbell in the Time magazine, she wrote that uh, China economic, China's economy has contact, contracted by 6.8% uh, six, six, in the first quarter of 2020, and over 460,000 firms have been shut down. So, so my point is that when you also see how BRI has been impacted uh, over two thirds of the BRI projects have been badly hit during the pandemic. Even Victoria Aid in Australia has canceled uh, some contracts uh, related to BRI. So you think uh, 2030 or 2050 is too long a time in the context of what has happened in the last 12 months to make projections where China would be and where India would be. Yeah, I mean, those extrapolations are always difficult. So mm -hmm. that's for sure. Uh, nobody can pretend. And, and they're also uh, up for debate on India. Uh, we may grow much faster than people think. We may grow slower. At the moment, it's not a very positive picture. I mean, let's accept that. And China has certainly done better during the pandemic than, than India has done. Um, and uh, so having said that, I mean, I think I agree that, uh, and the last part of the book, you know, which we haven't dealt with, which is the final chapter, which is a chapter uh, titled Looking Ahead, which is your question. Uh, it's quite a long chapter and a lot of it is about China actually, because the publisher said to me, you know, I think Indian readers will ask exactly the question that Ashutosh Mishra is asking, which is what's the future of Chinese power? I mean, we've all grown used to the idea that they're gangbusters, they're just gonna overwhelm everyone, uh, including the United States in time. And I do pull back from that position. I say that, yeah, there are, uh, of course, the gap with India is enormous, but can it be sustained and will they overtake the Americans? And I come out saying, um, you know, it's, uh, they may keep going, but it's not clear that they would overtake the United States. Uh, and what are some of those reasons? I draw on the work of uh, various people, but uh, in, in particularly Professor Beckley at, at Tufts, and he shows things like aging. Uh, so if you have a lot of old people supporting, uh, being supported by the youngest productive people in your society, I mean, it drains the system. Uh, it's an enormous burden. So there'll be an enormous fiscal burden as well, dealing with the healthcare and pensions and, and, and care of these uh, elderly people by fewer and fewer younger people. Um, there's, there are bubbles. Uh, we know that. Uh, there are SOEs in China, state-owned uh, enterprises that are in terrible shape, uh, that are getting more and more loans and so on from the government uh, and wasting money and it could all blow up. Um, there is, uh, you know, still issues of uh, trying to get out of the middle income trap in China. If they don't do the next uh, value add in the production chains, uh, they're going to remain, they're going to stagnate. Uh, that's the lesson everywhere. Uh, so if you add up bubbles, um, you know, uh, aging, demography, fiscal profligacy, um, and if they don't crack the technology, uh, they could be in, in trouble. And trouble means the growth rates may begin to flatten out. Um, so now the question is, to what extent do they flatten out? I mean, that's anybody's guess, and I'm not a modeler, economic modeler, and even they can't quite get it right ever. But one should note that all these kinds of... Um, fingers have been pointed at China for some years now, but they have repeatedly belied those expectations, doing better than people thought. So uh, I think it's an evenly balanced thing. Um, what would derail China, I, I say in, in the book, are three or four things. Um, the first is, I mean, 
if they don't deliver a, a kind of lifestyle. And that's not just economic growth. That's a certain degree of freedom uh, of people enjoying a certain way of expressing themselves publicly and privately, having control over their privacy, things like that. That's why the Soviet Union blew up. Uh, partly, is that not only were they losing the economic race, China is not losing that yet, but it they didn't deliver in a kind of lifestyle that uh, people in the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe wanted, a certain degree of freedom and, and, and autonomy in their, in their private lives. Second, if there's a disaster in China and it's badly handled, there's a history in China of people turning against their rulers. Third, if economic growth, and now we come to the economic, if it starts to flatten out or even you know, go completely flat. Uh, the expectation has been that the government will always deliver better growth rates, but if it flattens out, uh, you know, there is evidence in social science that when that happens in a country, uh, there can be a great deal of instability. And of course, the last is look at things like water or, or climate change. These could induce uh, fundamental constraints on China uh, and if they're badly handled, uh, you know, they could un unravel uh, you know, their governance and their growth. So uh, there are all kinds of reasons to, I think, to, to be cautious about where China is going. But sadly, uh, could we say with great confidence that India is on a sustained path of, let's say, 8 to 10 percent growth rates, which is what we need in order to really bridge the gap with China? I mean, except for those four or five years in the Manmohan Singh period, and debatably during the Modi period, because we know that the GD how you count GDP growth rate and so on was rejigged when Modi came along. Now, he's not the first government to do it, but the fact is that he did do it. Um, so wherever we are, I mean, we're not even in the Manmohan Singh era of growth rates on average. Uh, and if you're not in the eight to 10, then bridging the gap with China would be very difficult. Please note, as I say in the book, in the sort of 60 years since China uh, started developing and producing GDP figures since 1960. In those 60 years, India has only bettered China in, I think, 13 years out of 60. And that's including when China was communist, not, and India was a mixed free market, so, you know, and, and had elements of state enterprise. So in, in only 13 years out of 60, have we done better than China? Now, the past is the past. We could improve, but, you know, the way the pandemic has been handled in part, and the growth rates uh, collapse, the problems of unemployment, our own equivalent of SOEs, our banking system, a long way to go. Here's a figure uh, to be a bit more provocative. Um, if India, if China grows at 6% over the next 12 years, it will double its GDP, uh, which today is 15 trillion, it will have 30 trillion in the bank as its GDP. India, if it grows at 6%, or a little better. In 12 years, it'll double its GDP. We're at about slightly less than 3 trillion today. We will be 6 trillion. Today, the gap is $12 trillion, 15 minus 3. In 12 years at these growth rates, China will be at 30, India will be at 6, the gap will be $24 trillion. That's the absolute difference will have doubled. So, you know, we can see what is the kind of challenge that India faces if it wants to bridge the gap with China on the power, uh, on the economic power. And I think I, I agree, I agree with you. And in fact, I won't ask my next question because you preempted, I was going to talk about the way ahead. And, and you uh, very nicely, you have captured uh, various red flags uh, for China. Uh, and it has to be very wary on the demographic front on economic front and water and so on and so forth. And uh, but but skeptics would say, uh, uh, Professor Bajpayee, that uh, now uh, uh, since the early 20, uh, early days of 2020, when the outbreak uh, of COVID coronavirus impacted the world, many countries, including Australia and other Western democracies, who have been having a large trade with China, have been saying that we are now putting our sovereign interests, our national interests, over economic interest. And that is where I think uh, uh, hope for countries like uh, India, the way uh, India has conducted itself in the last uh, year and a half. And in terms of the kind of system, uh, despite all the pitfalls that Indian democracy has, you know, the transparency and everything that we bring to the table as a liberal democracy and rest of the world, which is represented by the uh, Commonwealth and a liberal democracy, I think we want an order which is more transparent and rule-based. Uh, and this is the kind of push towards which now leading country, leading Western democracies are pushing towards, where I think 
there is a big red flag for China, despite all its uh, economic prowess and, and growth projections. Uh, uh, but I will end up, uh, uh, Professor Bajpay, uh, by asking, so based on this research, what are the key gaps you think uh, now scholars must be looking into with regards to this uh, uh, relationship in China and China's own rise? Well, I mean, as I was saying at the beginning of the, the session, um, I mean, these are, in a way, the, the book is an opening gambit. Uh, these four P's that it looks at, uh, those are, you know, my estimation or understanding of those four P's is by no means the final word. So I think there's a lot of work that could be done on mutual perceptions. And I've had some interesting responses, which have made me, me uh, think about what I said in the book as well. Um, and one of them relates to a point you make, which is that, for instance, when in the perception chapter, I say China has these negative perceptions of India and Jabin Jacob in India uh, at Shivnada University said, yeah, but these are quite manufactured. Um, China, in fact, has a sneaking worry that India might catch up and become a, a rival. And so it tends to denigrate India. And this is a state campaign. It's not at the level of ordinary people necessarily. I think that's a very valuable point. The question is, what kind of research can we do to kind of show how much of a factor that is and how much I got it right and how much I got it wrong? And you know, I, I think there's a lot of work to be done on mutual perceptions on both sides um, through various instruments, uh, ethnographic to very formal survey instruments and so on that could be done. Um, I think also on the border issue, uh, more and more of the archives are opening up uh, on Tibet, on, 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 on the two sectors that are most at issue, the Eastern sector and the Western sector between the two. And I think a lot more work can be done. I know there's some very interesting books that are going to come out in the next few months on India, China, published in India by former diplomats who know this intimately, but even they have excavated, I think, some very valuable archival work. And I think knowing the past negotiations and, and so on will be very important ultimately in solving this problem, although it's not the only thing that will help solve the problem. But um, so I think a, a lot more work can be done. And I did no original work on the border issue at all. I mean, I just drew on what's very well known out there already. So I think you know uh, that's the second area for researchers to continue to mine the archives Hopefully, Chinese scholars can mine the Chinese archives, which really have not opened up for very long. The third is, of course, um, on these partnerships. You like that chapter. Actually, it's a chapter that I like the least, to be honest. So I think there's a lot more good work to be done there uh, on how the dynamics between these four powers, and particularly since the end of the Cold War. I mean, I only tell a bit of the story. Um, I think it's more complicated than, than even I, I, I try to show. Um, and um, lastly, on power, I think, yeah, there's a lot more to be done there, particularly on soft power. I mean, one of the things I point out there is the limits of the soft power concept and the measures that we're using. I mean, ultimately on soft power, it's, you know, most of the work is on, as in the Lowy Institute, is on what are the resources you have? Uh, how many uh, foreign tourists come to your country? How many foreign students in your universities? You know, how, how much, um, uh, how many heritage sites do you have under UNESCO and so on and so forth, et cetera. Um, but those only are resources. They don't tell you what's going on inside people's heads. Do they admire your country? How much do they? Uh, do, does that admiration chop and change under what circumstances? Um, so I think there are a lot of good work that can be done with natural experiments and, and other uh, uh, method, uh, methodologies to get better at the link between soft power resources actual perceptions of people. And then finally, do those perceptions matter to the way your elites and your government makes foreign policy? Uh, and whether it does make uh, people more sympathetic and persuaded towards another country uh, when you have these uh, soft power uh, differences. And lastly, I think, uh, you know, uh, there's a, there's a, a d discussion in my book on the military balance, which we haven't really talked about. And I say that India's despite being imbalanced vis-a-vis -vis China, uh, thanks to geography in part, can hold the Chinese off for some time. But I think much more needs to be done, particularly by military specialists on the real nature of the military balance and the kinds of strategies open to particularly India, I think, uh, also to China, uh, if one wants to uh, really develop a full picture uh, of uh, what would happen in a conflict. Uh, where are the strengths and weaknesses and how would it all turn out? I mean, I'm an amateur military strategist and I try out some ideas uh, from my uh, limited training, but I think specialists really have to game it through much better and not leave it, by the way, to the military um, folks. Um, I think uh, uh, retired military officials 
and academics who specialize in, in military affairs really need to look at the military balance. People like Arzan uh, Tarapur, uh, Oriana Scala Mastro, these are uh, young scholars who, who specialize in these areas. I think, Professor Vajpayee, there are a lot of interesting uh, suggestions here and ideas here. And I think uh, many of your students who are scattered around the world who listen to this interview perhaps will take cue from your uh, ideas and suggestions. Maybe they uh, take on the next leg of uh, the research on India-China relationship and also uh, perhaps strategic experts in India and around the world uh, will take you from, uh, from this interview. And uh, I want to end here by uh, saying this to many of the students around the world that uh, when I left uh, uh, Jawaharlal Nehru University after finishing PhD, uh, and this is, I think, very important for many of the students who are uh, currently doing PhD and doing research. When I left, you gave me two uh, uh, grand uh, guru mantras. And one was, you said that, Ashutosh, whatever you are writing in the future, always remember, you're not writing the last word on the subject. Because if you think you're writing the last word, you will never finish that research. And, and, and second was, please remember, no matter how bad the world is, no matter how cynical the world is, good work and hard work will never go unnoticed for long. And, and, and I must say, Professor Bajpayee, these two Guru Mantras have uh, put me always in good stead uh, wherever I have gone. And I want to thank you for, uh, for, uh, for your mentorship and guidance in JNU and for uh, imparting the fundamentals of uh, uh, high degree research and what I am. Uh, you you uh, you had a huge role to play in that, and I want to thank you uh, for taking time to speak to India News and also to the Institute for Australia India Engagement. I congratulate you on the book again, wishing you all the very best. And perhaps as the next project, you and I should work on the cooperative side of India Park India China relationship. Thank you very much for those kind words. I don't quite recognize myself in them, but it's nice of you to say. Uh, great to see you again, and and uh, thanks for doing the session. I enjoyed it very much. Yeah, let's uh, offline. Let's talk about uh, doing something together. Yeah. Thank you, Professor Vaishwai. Have a good day. Thanks very much. And for further news, views, analysis, and updates, please subscribe to India News Australia.